We're on? Yes. Oh, this is amazing. With the miracle of modern technology, we have managed to start our Facebook Live seminar. I'm so happy that you could be here. I uh, apologize deeply for the technical concerns, but we do what we can in the mo last moment. Um, so welcome. Please send your questions through the comments and I'll try to answer them as best I can. If you can't hear me, let me know. Also, I will try to slow down or speak louder. So let's begin. Um, I'm Rebecca Stein. I uh, am the founder of the Matriculates. We are a college essay uh, consultancy. We help students from all over the world write their best college essay. My background is in elite education. I have a master's degree from Harvard University in theology and a undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago in Near Eastern Studies. That's archaeology and ancient history. I was an Egyptologist by training. I have a 25 year history in college admissions. I started by helping myself. I then started helping my friends and then their children. Are we good? Okay. Um, when my children, when my friends' children started going to college, I started helping them draft their essays and we, uh, my business started. So um, I also am deeply involved at the University of Chicago. I do college and university service. I've been a college interviewer for Harvard and the University of Chicago for over 25 years. I'm on the alumni board of the University of Chicago, which is the highest volunteer position at the university. Um, we speak for the alumni on various issues, and I also do various other service for the university, including being on a museum board and a variety of other things. Um, Professionally, I have a background in management consulting and technical writing. I'm a professional writer, but my specialty now has become academic admissions. You can learn, learn more about my biography. You can look it up on our website, which is www.thematriculates.com. I'm gonna start a, with a little bit of an exercise, and I'll say, this is something I like to start workshops with, if you really knew me. So if you were a person who really knew me, you would know about me, and I had to come up with several things. The first one is, any food worth eating to me is worth putting hot sauce on. I like chili paste. Um, I cannot live without access to a pool, a bath, the ocean, uh, any body of water. Um, I love copy editing. I absolutely love, I'm a grammar Nazi, and I love taking sentences apart and fixing them so they are correct. I make my bed every morning. Um, if my newspaper is missing from my driveway in the morning, I feel absolutely lost. And I am working on learning to rest because you might notice I speak very fast and I tend to go very fast and I tend to work very hard. And so resting is a very interesting concept to me and I need to get working on it. Um, so why do I do this? I want you to take out a piece of paper if you're sitting at your desk. Some students may not be able to read what's written on the slide, ah. but you're covering them anyway, so that should be okay. Okay, so the question was, it's hard to read what's on the slide because the way we're, um, we're uh, projecting it, we'll find a way to either post it or you know distribute it later if you'd like to get access to the presentation. Also, we have a request for you to be a little louder. Okay, I'll try to be louder. <laughs> I'm very loud. All right, so why do I talk about if you knew me? I do this in this context. I want you to take out a pen and a piece of paper, and I want you to write down one thing that someone who really knew you, who lived very close to you, would know about you that's not related to your schooling or your academics. And you know, you can put this, just do this while I'm talking, or you know, we'll talk about it later. And the reason I'm asking you to do this is because frequently when we talk about college admissions, we're stuck up in our heads and we talk about our resumes and we talk about our academic progress and the course of study, things like that. But what I'm going to tell you is your personal statement should really be exactly what it sounds like, personal. And that has to get you out of this head thing and into more of your heart and talking about what it is that is really important to you emotionally. So that's how I want to contextualize this. and talk a little bit more about that later with the exercises that we'll do. Okay, so the rest of our workshop today is um, we have some goals and I want you to learn about the personal statement, 
I want you to understand what different colleges and universities are looking for. I want to help you avoid common mistakes. I want to offer you two templates or structures for your essay to consider. And I want to give you some exercises to get you started. I'm going to start this by saying you can write any essay you want. That is, it is personal and so you know, it is all about you and the choices you make. But the use of a template can help your reader relate. And the reason that is, is because the way we tell stories globally is the same. Um, so I have some techniques that are borrowed from screenwriting, movies, if you love movies, you'll start to recognize these, and epic literature, which are the ways we have tell, told stories as human beings um, for a long time. Slow me down if I'm going too slow, if you're going too fast. Um, using a template or a structure can make the task easier for you um, by streamlining that process. It, it's easier to write an essay that you know how it has to go than it is to sit looking at your blinking cursor and not know where to begin. I also have exercises for you to develop content to help write your story. Because if I sit down and I say, tell me about you, frequently students will look at me and say, I can't tell you about me, I have no idea what to say. So I have many, many exercises to give you that um, will help you start answering that question. Any questions? No questions? Okay. We're going to start with the first question, which is what are schools or universities or colleges looking for? And this is particularly for international students. What I'll say is they're looking, one of the first things they're looking for is maturity. Are you grown up enough? Are you grown up enough to be in school thousands of miles from home? And resilience. Resilience is that same quality of if you get knocked down, can you get up? So what they're looking for is someone who's tough, who's you know grown up, and who's strong enough to do to be thousands of miles away from home because even in the United States, most students go to school very close to their home and they have a network of support structures, including their parents, their families, their friends. And for international students, that may not be true. So they're trying to figure out if you're going to not just survive, but thrive far and far from home. Acculturation is something they're also looking for. And that's the word acculturation is a very big word, and it means that. Are you capable of understanding and fitting in to a dominant culture that is different from the one that you grew up in? Have you absorbed it, the cultural norms and the processes of a, a different culture? And so the question is, will you be a fish out of water or are you going to be a unique contribution to their pond? They're checking your language skills and asking if you can communicate effectively. And finally, they're asking for, to hear your voice. And what that means is, do you know who you are and can you express it and are you unafraid to do that? Do we have any questions? Okay, good. Four minutes. So I'm gonna start this with a warning and see, say, be very afraid. Why is a personal statement so important and why do you have to spend a, an enormous amount of time on it or at least put a lot of effort into it, it's because you have about one minute to grab your reader's attention. An entire admissions file at most universities is read for six to eight minutes. That is transcripts, test scores, course of study, recommendations, and your personal statement. Many, many files are not read all the way through. So, your essay has to grab your reader's attention in the first hundred words. It can't be boring, it can't be average, you're going to have to really step out of the box and get someone's attention. And so that's why I say be very afraid. I also say take heart because admissions officers frequently say the same thing which is half or more of the essays that they read are probably a first draft. So any effort you give to your essay past the first draft is going to be additive to your file and to the success of it. One of the really interesting things, as they say, is that the, the majority of those essays that they see, the personal statements, are boring, vague, general, and say nothing about the candidate. 
They also may be one of the top 10 lists of essays not to write, which I'll show you on the next page. They have grammar mistakes. They clearly haven't been proofread or they fall into the plagiarism or they were essays that were purchased online or clearly haven't been written by the candidate. So those are all things you should avoid. I also wanna help you understand a little bit, this isn't on the slide, but who admissions officers are. And we have in our minds frequently that they're you know, older people, they're mature, and they're, you, know, you have to impress them, it's like a professor. But in reality, most admissions professionals are, our admissions officers, junior admissions officers, are people who are very close to the age of the class that just graduated. They tend to be young people who just walked off the stage to graduation, from graduation. And the reason they do that is because they're the closest to the current class. They know what they're looking for, they know the characteristics of the university, and they have a sense of whether or not you would fit in. So I'm telling you that because sometimes you'll talk differently to someone your age than you will some, who's closer to your age than you will to someone who's much older. There are, of course, senior level admissions officers, but the majority of the people who are gonna be reading your essays the first time around tend to be younger than you think. So, back to our our slides, I want to talk about the top 10 essays not to write. And these are the essays that, you know, admissions officers have read so many times that they really don't say anything about the candidate. The first one is my service, my mission trip, or my charitable trip. Uh, a resume in narrative form. When I was five years old, I started and wanted to be a doctor and blah, blah, blah. Um, what soccer or my sports injury has taught me about teamwork. Uh, there's one called my grandfather or my grandmother or you know someone in my family is my hero uh, my family's history in a profession that one is my grandfather was a doctor i my father is a doctor i would like to be a doctor uh, my political manifesto people will write about their political feelings uh, my reaction to a world event there's a lot of that that happens after you know, a sports win, or there was a ton of those in the United States after September 11th, 2001. Ode to my significant other. You will not believe it, but people do write this. It's a, you know, how much I'm going to miss my boyfriend or girlfriend. Um, anything meta or overly uh, offbeat or clever that's, um, people will do things like an acrostic, which is the first letters of the sentences will form the name of the school something kind of crazy like that, or anything too personal, illegal, or scandalous. Before moving on to the next one, we have a question. Yes. Are transcripts important? Transcripts are important. I, I will say that I don't um, specialize in the whole package. I only do essays, but yes, of course, your course of study and your grades are going to be important, but one of the things that I've been talking with here with um, Roham and Tina at Mesa's is um, the universities are feeling increasingly stuck by um, test scores and I know it's different than the question on transcripts but they're moving away like for last week the University of Chicago uh, announced that they would make uh, ACT and SAT testing optional a lot of the um, elite universities in the United States are making the ACT writing portion optional or not accepting it at all uh, so there's some kind of a sea change going on about um, grades and test scores overall because admissions officers are aware that they don't tell the whole story about a candidate. Does that help answer the question? Okay. Going on. All right, so we had our top 10 list of essays not to write and I'm making a correction for myself. Though there are ways to talk about all of those topics, but if you choose to do so, it has to be done carefully. Um, other advice is authenticity is very, very important. Using your authentic voice, writing your own words. Um, poetic license is allowed, fabrication is not. And why did I say poetic license? I say you can do a composite, like a, a quote from a, a, an adult in your life, some advice they gave you that sort of, you know, you can, you can take a bunch of things that they've said to you and make them into one quote. What you can't do is just make up something that they never said. I ask you to write what you know. Uh, take a risk that there are things um, that you might not wanna say, but sometimes that's the richest information and the thing that will say the most about you to an admissions officer. 
And finally, if it gives you goosebumps, it's good. So what we're looking for is vulnerable, authentic stories. Okay, we're moving on to what question does the personal statement answer? And this is really important when you look at all of the essays that you will be asked to write. There are supplemental essays for each school. Um, and each of them has a question that they're looking to answer that may not be what you think it is. So the personal statement answers the question, tell us about you and why college is the next step for you. Now, I differ from many college counselors in this because I think you have to connect the dots between why you need to go on to college rather than just assuming that it is a universal good. I think you have to connect your personal story to a course of study or an institution or you know, some need to go on to college, that there's something that college and university is going to do for you, and I think you have to connect those dots. So what I'll say is that there are um, four types of students and four types of essays. You don't have to be one. Maybe you're more than one of these, but there's one you may lean toward. Mathematicians, you will love my two by two matrix. There are types of students, all of you, I'll ask you, have you experienced any challenges in your life or faced a significant challenge in your life? I know I have, but there are lots of students who say, oh, I have, have a pretty nice family life, I have great parents, I have enough money, I don't really have any challenges, and that's okay too. They're just ways to find out what the right story is for you to write. And then there are students who know what they wanna study, or students who don't know what they want to study. And so if you take those two, two um, axis of axes of the matrix, there are students who type A, students who um, face significant challenges and know what they want to study. So sometimes a challenge in your life will feed into um, an awareness that there's something that you want to do further. That's frequently children who had a medical issue might say that I want to then go into some field of medicine to help kids like me. That makes sense. But then there are students who have not have faced significant challenges and don't know what they want to study. And on the other hand, you also have students who haven't faced significant challenges and but do know what they want to study because they're passionate about a particular topic or field. And then there are students who haven't faced challenges and don't know what they want to study. And you think, oh no, that person's got no ammunition. Well, that's actually um, some of the richest writing I've ever read is from students like that because they talk about themselves. So you have type A and C are students who face significant challenge and type B and D are students who haven't. And I'm just, this is a guideline, a rough guideline. I will say that there are a couple different types, there are two types of structures. You can have one we call the hero's journey and the other one is called a montage. I'm gonna talk about each of those. A hero's journey is for type A and C, people who generally have faced significant challenges. And a montage is easier for someone who has not faced significant challenges, those kids in the boxes for type B and D. So a hero's journey is a story that um, all of us know. Have you ever watched a movie, if you've ever watched a movie and you felt like you know how it's gonna go, that is because you've internalized usually the way that we tell stories in all the cultures across the world. And those tend to be hero's journeys. Every movie you can think of, Star Wars, uh, Thor Ragnarok, all of these stories are hero's journeys. Um, the hero's journey really is borrowed from the first uh, evidence of it in culture was in epic literature. The Epic of Gilgamesh, A Thousand One and One Arabian Nights, the Ramayana, all of these huge stories of personal struggle, of conflict that we read about in you know, our literature classes. There is a book on this. If you're interested, you can go check it out at the library or buy it on, online. It's uh, called a Hero, The Hero with a Thousand Faces by a writer called Joseph Campbell. And A Hero's Journey essentially is a, gro a story of personal growth and change. And if you think about something like Star, Star Wars, Luke Skywalker grows up, he doesn't know who he is, he has conflict with his family, he wants to move on, he then goes and jumps on the spaceship and flies off with Han Solo and the droids and then becomes a Jedi Master. It's a story, for, it's a hero's journey. Those stories have cause and effect connections, that means something happened and I reacted. It has a beginning, middle, and an end. 
Now, the second type of structure you could use or consider is called a montage. And the word montage is how you make a new composite piece or a new um, whole piece of art or something from composite parts. Um, it's borrowed from screenwriting. I have some examples you can see of this. It delivers information and shows time passage in a really economical way. Those can be engaging, they can be inspiring and even epic, but it creates a composite portrait of you. Um, and the way that it connects things, uh, or puts things together for you, is thematically. Are we good? Okay, we're good. I'll explain more about that in a moment. Okay. Let's go back and talk about a hero's journey briefly. It is a deep dive. It's one story, cause and effect. And you may remember this or have read this in your literature classes. It's a story of movement, uh, literally or metaphorically, from one place to another. It starts with the status quo, how things used to be. It has a part of rising action or an inciting incident or what we call a status quo change, and that's the what happened portion. There's a, motion, a portion where the stakes get raised, what I did to fix it, the moment of truth, how it worked or did not, and then a new status quo has emerged, who I am after all this has occurred. So I have an example of a story I can tell you. I'm um, usually in a seminar, I would hand this out and let you read it, but I'm gonna talk to you about an essay that I did, uh, a, um, one essay that I did this year. Um, it was a hero's journey. It was what I call special circumstances essay. It was a young man who had, had a history of um, substance abuse and some um, uh, learning disabilities and it kind of ended up uh, in uh, medical rehab. And you think, that's never, you know, if I do that, you know, I'll never get into a college. Well, it actually, when he wrote this story, it became so powerful because it was a story of personal change. And we, st so if you look at his story, it started like this, where he, um, you know, the beginning of his, of the story was where he uh, was diagnosed with learning disabilities, had some social, emotional, and substance abuse issues. He struggled with his family. He got into trouble. He ended up in the hospital. But then through that process of receiving good care, he forgave himself. He graduated from high school. He took two jobs. He worked really, really hard. Um, and he got into a, a good university in Chicago and that had academic success. And at that point, you know, the redemption was a professor came to him and said, you're really good at this. He's like, me? I'm really good at this? Yep. And then the end of it is that he's applying to law school. So it was a story of personal growth and change, but the interesting thing that I would have showed you had I hadn't handed this out is the story started, the first paragraph was him waking up in the hospital. And then we went back and caught these stories and then moved forward. But the, that solved that problem of really grabbing the attention of the reader in the first hundred words. So story, hero's journeys are really powerful, but I frequently tell them you put the, um, the really critical moment at the beginning to solve that problem, getting your reader invested and you wanna move, uh, keep their attention, get them to read the whole thing. Questions? Okay. I think you're good. Good, okay, we're going forward. Now, a montage. Now, if you don't know what you, if you've never faced challenges in your life and you wanna write about yourself, you use a montage or there's one way to do it. It's a technique of taking um, different, values that you have, that you wanna talk about yourself, facets of your personality, and you filter them through a topic or a, um, a theme to give an efficient picture of who you are. And usually at this point, I show a couple videos. I've got one, um, if you go on YouTube and look it up, there's a, there's Rocky, the movie Rocky, there's a montage of it. So just look up Rocky training montage and watch that and it shows you when you're watching it um, how Rocky you know struggles over adversity that he's really interested in in working that he gets very tired but he persists and so it's a whole bunch of, of little snippets of his training that's the classic movie montage and there's also one called um, from a movie called Rushmore it's called the yearbook montage and it shows a lot of different characteristics of a student called Max Fisher 
So I suggest that you look both of those up. And we'll move on and talk about the next thing. Um, so a montage, when you think about it, it needs a theme. And you can be as creative as you want. Some of the best montages I've read in my life have been kind of way out there. One was on makeup. It was a young woman who wrote about all the different types of makeup that she used and what each of them meant to her about her personality. Um, I read one about rap music where someone picked, a young man picked four or five different rap lyrics that really meant a lot to him and he talked about why. Um, and so a montage helps your reader relate to you through a series of uh, different uh, but related ideas. So what you have to do in order to write a good montage is you discern what your values are and I have an exercise that I hand out usually at this point called the values exercise where you pick what you know kind of go quickly through a list of values and you figure out what the ones that are most important to you are. Um, um, are we good? So the video can be on the TV itself and she can sit separately. That way, the view will be better. Yeah. Okay. Should we take a pause for now, then? Yeah. Oh, take well. a pause. We pause and come right back. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah. This is better. You can talk. Okay. We got it. We're still on. Yeah. We're okay. On. Good. So one of the best montages I read this year was called "Advice My Grandmother Gave Me." And what I'm going to say is that this started out as a very typical My Grandma is My Hero essay. And what I said was, um, do you want me to sit? Okay. What I said was that I, you know, she needed to change that to be less about her grandmother and more about her. And the essay, I, I said, go find some card, birthday cards. And she said, well, I have these birthday cards my grandma sent to me. And I said, go through them and find some quotes that your grandmother said to you, what, what advice did she give you? And she took those four different sort of statements her grandmother had made, wrote one sentence about what, how her grandmother lived it, and then a second sen sentence about how she lived it. And it was really successful. She got into, I think, Johns Hopkins University. It was just delightful. Um, so if you're gonna do a montage, there we go. So it might go forward, here we go. Yeah, it started out as, uh, anyways, if you're gonna do a montage, you need to identify your values and characteristics, pick a, a theme or a filtering lens to do it, and then see what you can say about those things. Um, I'll say one last thought here on writing, is that what makes an essay stand out? And this is the question that a lot of students come to me with. They say, I have never done anything interesting. Well, there are a couple different ways for essays to stand out. One is unusual content. People can tell you about the amazing things they've done, and you're like, wow, that's great. The other thing is unusual connections. And not everyone has unusual content. I realize that there are very, um, kids, uh, many, many students live normal lives. But everyone can make an unusual connection. And that is on you to interpret your life in a way that is interesting to your reader. So for instance, I'm using, I'll use basketball for an example. There are lots of students who play basketball and they write the story of the, with the usual connections. What basketball taught me about teamwork and effort and the meaning of winning or the meaning of failure. And that's a perfectly fine essay. I'm not gonna say that that's not, that's never been successful. But if you wanted to turn that on its head and talk about basketball in a different way. You might say, what is basketball, if I was a basketball player, tell me about my sense of privacy. Or, you know, I was thinking particularly of a student who really, really, really didn't like to be, to fail. And he was so um, private that he got up at 5.30 in the morning and shot free throws until he made every one every morning because he just didn't want to do that in front of other people. Or what about diversity? You could say like what does it mean to be um, like a very short guy on a basketball team? Or I was thinking one of, of, and I'm just riffing on here, what about what could basketball tell you about patriotism? And I was thinking of you know a kid who grew up in a, on a uh, army base in South Korea or in Germany where there wasn't a basketball team and he started one because it made him feel connected to 
um, his culture back home. So my statement here is you really have to dig deep for the content that is gonna really differentiate you. And there's a couple, I have handouts that I usually hand out if you want to come. We have a um, paid workshop tomorrow. I have handouts to give you and exercises that I could give you that help you start getting these, um, this content developed. So for instance, I have, a, I have a values exercise that helps you figure out what your values are. Oh, hi. And um, anyway, so that's where we go. So are there any questions? No other personal statement. Maybe you can talk about the Common App application. Yep, the rest of it. Also give a summary on, on the Common App Bootcamp. Yeah, OK. And also give a summary on the personal statement that you asked for. So yep, yep, yep. So the Common App Bootcamp tomorrow, what time are we doing? Nine and two. We'll do it nine and two. Um, if you A-level students are able to get out of school, speak to your parents, and come to the Mesa's offices, um, it's four hours. And what we do is go through all of the content development tools that I hand out, and we sit together and talk about you know which category, which quadrant you fit into. Are you an A and and C student? Are you a B and D type student? Um, we do the exercises to help develop your personal story, and then I will sit with each of you one-on-one -on -one and kind of start, you know, figuring out what it is that you're going to write and help you get directed toward the, the beginning of the, that structure. And, um, you know, if you come, bring your laptop, and we can start writing. And I think you can, it depends on how fast you write, but a lot of people have at least an outline and some words on the page before they leave. Um, Additionally, I will go over um, the use of the activities list and the additional information section on the common application. I have tips and tricks for those. I have situations I can help you understand what they're used for and what they're not used for. Um, and then, you know, there's ongoing follow-up afterwards with, um, we, can, we can do more follow-up online and then we can talk about supplemental applications as well. Questions? Um, I think there is a question. Um, before we go on to the question, if you want to, um, again, wrap up on the personal statements, just the important things that yeah. you need to remember. Yeah. So let's just go back a little bit and think about the personal statement overall. I'm just going to click back to the, um, the main point here okay. about um, what it's for. And what the what the personal uh, and, the, and the things to be afraid of. Do you want us to go back to the screen? Oh no, it's okay. okay. I just want to remind you really strongly. You have about a minute to grab your reader's attention, and I think that freaks a lot of students out. So the question was that how to get attention. Is it okay to start with a quote, or just how to start? Oh yes. How to get the okay. Attention? So some people say don't start with a quote, and some people say um, do you know that it's okay. What I'm going to say is you probably can do better than that. Um, that your personal story, your personal story, if you if you find a quote that you want to talk about, let's actually figure out why and write a story that's more interesting because admissions officers do get drowned in quotes, but I think you can, I mean, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen, but what I can say is that you can probably do better than that. Word limit. Oh, 650 words for the uh for the U.S. Common App, and it is 4,000 characters. 4, characters for including UK, spaces. including spaces for UK. They end up about the same, I think. The UK might be slightly longer, but um, that is a very tight, the very tight uh, word limit. And I will just say something about supplemental essays: that when you apply to many U.S. schools, you have additional essays that have to be submitted. Usually one is, um, why do you want to go to our school? What will you bring to our community? Um, Stanford University has 10 supplemental applications, some as short as 50 words. Um, there's a letter to your roommate. There is a, a, what are you reading? What media have you consumed lately? Lots of things like that. So um, word limits are, it's much harder sometimes to write a shorter one than it is to write a longer one. More questions? Um, not at the moment. Okay, so let's go over how to uh, sign up for tomorrow. Is you should call or should they call or text you? Should they call or text you? They can. They can just um, yeah. They can SMS us. Yeah, you know, they can. They SM can also write on our Facebook page. Yep, yeah, exactly. You can write on the Facebook page by SMS. Call the office um, to sign up tomorrow nine and two, and we hope that we can fill it up. We've got a few spaces left, and we'd love to see you.
All right. I, it seems like we don't have any. Okay, how many times should a student draft his or her essay? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, writing is rewriting. And I'm going to say that there's not a... Um, from a first draft to, I've seen as many as, you know, by, by the fourth draft you should be um, done with the structural changes and content should be more or less there and after that point it's more grammatical and phrasing of sentences, but more than one is the answer. <laughs> Definitely after the first draft. Yes, more than one. Um, I think that's about it. Yes. Well, happy writing, children. Come see us. We'd be happy to see you.